Good evening. My name is Michael Clare, and I'm co-chair of the Committee for a Sane U.S.-China Policy. And our, that organization, our organization, is the sponsor of tonight's webinar. The topic is, what should U.S. policy towards Taiwan be? And this is obviously a very significant topic, and we'll have a lot of opportunity to probe why that's so and what are the risks involved in U.S. policy. Uh, this program is co-sponsored by the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security and by Massachusetts Peace Action. And we're all very pleased that you're here to join us. I will uh, describe to you the evening's program so you have a sense of how it's going to go. Uh, we're going to, we have two panelists, Mike Mokazuki and Zhi Kuan Zhu. Uh, and they will each uh, address two rounds of questions. The first round of question will be about current US policy. What is current US policy towards Taiwan? and how it's headed, what is the current trajectory, and what are the perils that are involved in current US policies? What are the dangers? So they'll each have about seven to 10 minutes to address that question. Then we'll come back to each of them. And the question then will be, what would be alternative policies towards Taiwan? What would be how could we avoid the dangers implicit in current US policies? And after that, I might ask one or two questions for clarification, and then you and the audience will have a chance to raise questions of your own. To uh, pose a question to our panelists, use the Q&A function on your screen. There won't be a chat, so uh, I won't see questions that way and I, I won't be able to see raised hands, but I will see the Q&A function on your screen and we'll read through those to make sure we get to see what your questions will be. So with that, let me just begin with a very brief um, setting for tonight's panel. Uh, Taiwan is obviously a key issue in U.S. foreign policy today, and it's likely to remain so for some time to come. The Economist magazine has called it the most dangerous place on earth because of the possibility that it could spark a conflict between the U.S. and China, possibly a nuclear war. What are the issues that might make this possible? This is what our speakers will address. To put this in a framework let me just say one or two words about the backdrop. In 1979, at the very beginning of 1979, the US recognized the People's Republic of China as the sole representative of China. At that time, the US indicated in a communique with Beijing that it acknowledged the Chinese position that Taiwan was part of one China. But it has said then and since then that the differences between Taiwan and China, how to resolve the fact that they were not governed by the same government should be resolved in a peaceful manner. Also in 1979, Congress passed the Taiwan Relations Act, which said that uh, we, that is the United States believes that these, that the issue of Taiwan's future with relation to China should be solved in a peaceful manner. And that if any country were to try to change its status in a military way through violence, the US would view that as a grave danger and a threat to regional security. It did not say that the US would involve itself in such an occasion. And so this has been called the policy of strategic ambiguity. It's un, it doesn't say that the US will intervene in such a case. But in recent years, and especially under the Biden administration, both of these principles, the one China policy 
and the Taiwan Relations Act of a position of strategic ambiguity have come under attack. Some, many, I should say, in Congress and the Republican Party believe that the US uh, should abandon the one China policy and move towards the recognition of Taiwan as an independent state and to abandon strategic ambiguity in favor of a position that the US should support Taiwan militarily if it were attacked. These moves have obviously angered the Chinese government because of and, and the China, many in China because of the belief that Taiwan should be part of China and leading to very strong statements from Beijing that this would be crossing a red line. And this is the backdrop for the current risks of conflict. So I will stop there. And we will now turn to our two knowledgeable panelists to, uh, to address uh, uh, the, the history, the evolution of US policy and where it's headed. Our first speaker will be Xi Quan Zhu, who is professor of political science and international relations at Bucknell University in Lehigh, Pennsylvania, and the MacArthur Chair of East Asian Studies. Uh, Xi Quan is a regular contributor to The Hill and other publications, and he is often cited uh, in the media. Uh, he is also a member of the steering committee of, of the Committee for Saying U.S.-China Policy. Xi Quan will be followed in the first round by Mike Mokatsuki, who is the Japan-U.S. Relations Chair at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. And he directs, I'm gonna read this, Mike, the Memory and Reconciliation in the Asia Pacific Research and Policy Project at the Seagor Center for Asian Studies at George Washington University, right? Yes. And I, that project sounds very interesting. Maybe later you could tell us about that especially if it bears on this topic. So, so Xiquan, uh, thanks for agreeing to take this on. It's your time to begin the conversation and uh, we'll give you about 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to be working with you and to contribute something to our same, same committee. I'm also very glad uh, today to be sharing the panel with Professor Mochizuki. Um, so we all know for China, the Taiwan issue has been front and center in the US-China relationship since 1949. Uh, we all know that uh, the issue originated from the unfinished Chinese civil war that resulted in Chiang Kai-shek's relocation of his government to Taiwan and the PRC's funding on the mainland. Initially, the People's Liberation Army planned to use force to liberate Taiwan and complete the Chinese Civil War. Now the outbreak of the Korean War and the US decision to protect Taiwan prevented the PRC from achieving that objective. Since 1979, in conjunction with Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up policy, and the normalization of the US and PRC relations. The PRC's Taiwan policy has changed to emphasize peaceful unification. And since then, the PRC has also used one country and two systems as a model for Taiwan's integration into the PRC. Now, while emphasizing peaceful unification, China has not renounced the use of force under certain conditions. And that policy has been consistent. China passed an anti-secession law in 2005, which outlines certain conditions under which the PRC will use non-peaceful means. For example, if a major event occurs which would lead to Taiwan's separation from China, or if all possibility of peaceful unification is lost, China may use force to take Taiwan back. So there was essentially uh, no contact between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait between uh, 1949 and 1987. 
when Chiang Kai-shek's son, Chiang Ching Guo, lifted the martial law in Taiwan and allowed the KMT soldiers to visit families on the mainland. Since then, especially since the early 1990s, trade, travel, and other exchanges across the Taiwan Strait have boomed. Uh, until recently, you know, when the Democratic Progressive Party returned to power in Taiwan in 2016, and of course with the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. The relationship was particularly close between 2008 and 2016, when Ma ying was in power from the KMT party. And two sides actually signed uh, 23 agreements for cooperation. However, as Michael also mentioned, in recent years, the situation in the Taiwan Strait has changed and the likelihood of war is increasing. I think the major reasons are, number one, US-China strategic competition. Number two, domestic development, develop, developments in China, in Taiwan, and in the United States. Beijing, of course, under Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's leadership has become um, more assertive and more determined to unify with Taiwan as part of the Chinese dream or the national rejuvenation. Taiwan, under, under the leadership of the DPP, has rejected the concept of both sides belonging to one China. The idea that Taiwan and China are two separate countries is getting more and more popular in Taiwan, especially among the young people. Meanwhile, the United States has been playing the Taiwan card in the US-China rivalry. Now, the US official position is that it follows uh, one China policy and does not support Taiwan independence. In practice, a lot of changes have taken place or are taking place. Uh, due to time limit, I just cite some examples here. First example, the United States has become more directly and deeply involved in Taiwan's internal and external affairs. Uh, we learned that starting from uh, September 2023, under the so-called Taiwan Fellowship Program, US government officials and military officers can be placed in Taiwan's government and legislature. And it was also recently revealed that the United States will send up to 200 additional troops to Taiwan to help train Taiwan's military. And at the same time, will train over 500 Taiwanese soldiers in the United States. Congressional visits to Taiwan take place all the time, but in recent years, such visits have significantly increased almost on a weekly basis. While at the same time, such visits to China, to the mainland have declined, have dropped to zero. Members of Congress care less and less about Beijing's reactions to their rhetoric and actions on Taiwan. And the White House and Congress sometimes play the game of good cop, bad cop. When confronted by Beijing, Washington's response will be typically that, you know, we have three branches of government and separation of powers. It is true, of course, <laughs> that the executive branch and the legislative branch are independ in independent, but to use domestic politics to justify Washington's upgrading relations with Taiwan and departing from the long-standing one China policy is not particularly helpful nor convincing. Another example, you know, the US government is more serious about its commitment to Taiwan, but it is not offering credible reassurance to Beijing. It seems the US support for Taiwan nowadays has become unconditional. So Beijing is questioning whether the United States is seriously only maintaining unofficial relations with Taiwan. Now, when US officials and congressional leaders visit Taiwan in their official capacity and talk about strengthening US-Taiwan relations publicly, it is clear that the United States is not keeping its commitment to only maintaining unofficial relations with Taiwan. And the Taiwan Travel Act, which was passed in uh, 2018, has made it even more convenient for official contacts between Washington and Taipei. Now, so the US longstanding policy has been to oppose 
unilateral change to the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. Today, Washington itself is undermining the status quo by not taking a balanced approach to Taipei and Beijing. Most recently, for example, Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman said at a Brookings Institution event, I quote, our one China policy remains unchanged. What has changed is Beijing's more aggressive behavior towards Taiwan, unquote. Well, she did not explain why Beijing has become more aggressive. Why were cross-strait relations stable and even friendly when Ma ying was in power? Today, uh, the DPP government claims that Taiwan is already an independent state and Taiwan and China should not be subordinate to each other. This is a clear violation of the Republic of China's own constitution, as former President Ma ying pointed out. Yet Washington has chosen to remain silent. Now, final example uh, is that there's a tendency in the United States, both politicians and the media, to reframe the Taiwan issue and simplify it as that between democracy and autocracy. The separation of Taiwan from China is a result of the unfinished Chinese civil war. Taiwan has become a democracy, but it does not mean that we can change history, especially the one China history shared by both sides until the DPP came to power and tried to change it unilaterally. Taiwan uh, today, you know, the dominant narrative in the United States and the West is that an authoritarian China is bullying a small democracy and is, is going to invade Taiwan. Now, such an, an narrative, you know, is, is, is powerful, especially among people who are uninformed of the history and the complexity of the issue. Uh, the autocracy versus democracy narrative is clearly misleading. It disregards the historical context of the issue and simplifies a complex historical and sovereignty issue into an easy political choice. So fi finally, uh, I think to me, you know, most, appointed, most disappointedly is that the United States is not promoting cross-strait dialogue and peace anymore. Instead, its intention to keep Taiwan separate from China is becoming very obvious. In the past, the United States government, especially you know, diplomats and also scholars, were the most consistent and vocal supporters of cross-strait dialogue. Nowadays, in, you know, nobody in Washington, D.C. is promoting dialogue and peace. Everybody's talking about when the war will break out. So Washington used to be vague about its long-term goal in Taiwan, and it was believed that the United States did not really care about a particular outcome, so long as the process is peaceful. But today, it seems the United States will not support cross-strait unification, even if unification is achieved peacefully. Increasingly, the United States sees Taiwan as a strategic asset that cannot be lost to China, and some officials publicly support Taiwan independence. So I'm wondering, is Washington closing the door for a possible peaceful unification between China and Taiwan in the future? We all know that if Beijing feels that door is closed, it will be forced and compelled to open another door, meaning using force. Is that in everybody's interest? I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xi Kun. I, I'm going to later, after we go through this, I, I have some questions for you. But uh, I think we'll turn now to Mike and hear your perspective on these matters. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Michael. And I also want to thank uh, the Committee uh, on a Sane US China Policy uh, for organizing this event and uh, uh, invited me to participate uh, along with uh, Professor Zhu. Uh, Professor Ju has done such a fantastic job of giving a comprehensive overview of what's behind uh, the recent uh, tensions uh, uh, in the Taiwan Strait and the changes uh, in U.S. attitudes and U.S. policies. So it's, it's very hard for me to add much uh, 
uh, to his presentation, and I agree 100% uh, with everything uh, he has uh, said. Uh, so uh, maybe what I can do is to kind of complement his points a, a little bit more uh, uh, to, to add a, 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 a somewhat broader perspective. Uh, but first, um, on the question of uh, how this is all happening, I, I think uh, Professor Ju was absolutely right that uh, during uh, the Ma Ying-jeou uh, presidency, cross-strait relations uh, uh, were not only calm, but there was a lot of uh, dialogue and cooperation uh, between uh, Taiwan and China. Uh, and many of us felt uh, that the possibility of a military conflict across the Taiwan Strait had pretty much uh, receded. Uh, but as Professor Ju pointed out, uh, after uh, the uh, uh, return of the Democratic Progressive Party uh, to power uh, under the presidency of Tsai Ing-wen, uh, things uh, began to uh, get heated uh, again. And I think one of the, the reasons for this is not just that the DPP uh, had come back into power, but I think uh, uh, over the last uh, few decades, uh, we've seen gradually, but an, an unmistakable kind of change uh, in uh, the attitudes of the people who live in uh, Taiwan. Uh, uh, in, in the past, uh, if there was one thing that uh, Taiwan and China seemed to agree upon uh, was that uh, there is one China uh, and uh, China, uh, Taiwan is part of China. The, the main disagreement was uh, which regime had legitimacy over all of uh, China. Uh, but uh, especially after the period of democratization, increasingly I think there's been uh, a deepening of a sense of a national identity that is separate uh, from a Chinese identity. And so a, a number of opinion polls suggest that the people in Taiwan increasingly see themselves as Taiwanese uh, rather than uh, Chinese, uh, and uh, basically Taiwan is a separate country uh, from that of, of China, and so uh, they don't want to be uh, uh, unified uh, with uh, mainland uh, uh, China. And so it's that kind of sea change in views within Taiwan uh, that has uh, played a, a role in the reemergence of the Democratic uh, Progressive Party, the DPP, uh, uh, to power uh, and uh, Tsai Ing-wen's uh, refusal uh, to endorse the so-called 1992 consensus uh, that emerged uh, from a dialogue between the mainland uh, and Taiwan representatives in 1992. Uh, they basically came to kind of an understanding, an agreement uh, that there is only one uh, China uh, and uh, Tsai Ing-wen uh, is unwilling to and recognize this uh, principle of uh, one China. So uh, uh, after uh, Tsai Ing-wen became president, uh, then I think China be, uh, be indeed began to be uh, quite assertive, uh, hostile uh, towards the Taiwan uh, 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 government. Um, it started to work on other uh, countries that had recognized the Republic of China rather than the People's Republic of China uh, as the, the legitimate uh, state of China and uh, has, has used diplomacy and uh, economic incentives to shift uh, those countries uh, to recognizing uh, the PRC rather than the Republic of China. And the latest case of this uh, is uh, Honduras. Uh, also, uh, after the Thai uh, presidency, uh, uh, mainland China uh, has started to play economic hardball against Taiwan, what some people might call uh, economic coercion, uh, and it has upgraded uh, the military activity uh, around uh, Taiwan to try to intimidate Taiwan. So these are all of the things that uh, people in Washington, policymakers in Washington emphasized, and I think that's what's uh, behind uh, Wendy Sherman's statement uh, that while the United States is reacting uh, 
uh, to what uh, China is doing to Taiwan. But uh, as uh, Professor Zhu uh, emphasized, uh, China is in a sense reacting to what it sees as alarming uh, trends uh, in Taiwan uh, it, itself. Uh, I completely uh, agree uh, with Professor Zhu uh, about um, how the, the one China policy of the United States, which has been the foundation uh, for maintaining peace and good relations between the United States and China, uh, has eroded. Uh, and uh, I think Professor Zhu has done an excellent job of going through uh, some of the, uh, uh, the indications of that. So even though the Biden administration says uh, that there is no formal change in the one China policy, it is no longer a credible reassurance uh, to China. And China does not believe that the United States really uh, subscribes to the one China policy. And in fact, what the United States is doing is actually uh, promoting uh, the independence of Taiwan. And then, although it's not official policy, many influential members of the US policy community are talking about moving from a position of strategic ambiguity, uh, which Michael talked about in the context of the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, uh, to a position of strategic clarity that the United States uh, should have a commitment to defend Taiwan if Taiwan is uh, uh, attacked, uh, full stop. Uh, and although Biden has said that there is no change in the one uh, China policy, on many occasions, when asked whether the United States would defend uh, Taiwan, he has clearly stated, not ambiguously, but clearly stated uh, that the United States would defend uh, uh, Taiwan. And, and then you have members of Congress uh, seeing this as an issue of defending a thriving uh, democracy. And some uh, high former officials of the US government are now uh, even uh, saying that uh, the United States should actually recognize Taiwan uh, as an independent uh, country. And I think uh, Professor Ju was absolutely uh, correct that now Taiwan has become, in a sense, a pawn in this uh, larger US-China strategic competition. And what I see happening in the United States is an inflation of the China threat so that China is seen as a rising power uh, that is seeking to overthrow uh, what some people call the US-led liberal international order. Now, uh, whenever someone says that, you know, I really don't know what's meant by the US-led uh, liberal international uh, order. Uh, I, I certainly think that the United States has a foreign policy agenda of promoting liberal uh, internationalism uh, to, uh, to a large extent. Uh, but whether such an order actually exists and whether the United whether China is willfully trying to overthrow that order uh, certainly uh, uh, is a dubious uh, claim. And if there is such an order, uh, why should China actually try to overthrow that uh, uh, when China has benefited so much uh, from uh, the uh, current uh, order. Uh, one thing uh, I would add uh, to Professor Jew's uh, uh, presentation is that in addition to the change in US policy towards Taiwan and US policy and behavior towards uh, China, what's also happening is a change in US policy towards allies. There is now a concerted effort to mobilize US allies and what's called uh, US partners to develop a containment strategy against uh, China. Uh, and the United States understands that if it wants to intervene to defend Taiwan in a Taiwan conflict, uh, then it certainly needs the active support uh, of uh, Japan. Uh, at a minimum, 
uh, free use of U.S. military bases and assets uh, located in Japan. But on top of that, uh, uh, the United States would like uh, uh, the Japanese to provide rear area support and, if possible, direct support uh, for the defense of uh, Taiwan. And I think uh, this is a very dangerous tendency. Uh, given the uh, Japanese colonial history over Taiwan uh, and still the kind of the lack of reconciliation between Ch China and Japan about historical issues. If Japan were to sign on to a joint US Japan military strategy to defend Taiwan and to keep Taiwan separate from China and basically to promote the independence of Taiwan, this is highly sensitive and inflammatory and provocative towards China. And so although uh, China certainly prefers to achieve its goal of unification of Taiwan with China through peaceful means, uh, this transformation of the U.S. alliance network uh, could very much push China into a corner so that it feels uh, that the only option uh, is uh, to use military coercion and military force. And that's what makes the current trend in U.S. policy uh, so dangerous. Thank you. You're muted. Thank you. Thank both of you for bringing us to this point uh, and providing a lot of information, uh, much of which has me uh, very worried. I was worried before, uh, but now I'm more worried. Uh, so the next round of questions are, are to help us find uh, a way out of some of this. So I'm going to ask uh, both panelists to give us their thoughts on what alternative policies might look like that would reduce tensions over Taiwan and reduce the risk of a conflict between the US and China. And uh, by agreement, uh, I'm going to ask Mike to speak first, followed by Xi Quan. So Mike, if you wouldn't mind, please go ahead with your thoughts on this. Okay, uh, great. Uh, so um, in terms of what the United States uh, should do uh, to prevent a war with China over Taiwan, uh, first on my list uh, is that the United States needs to abandon this notion uh, that the, the U.S.-China strategic competition uh, is the basic framework for thinking about U.S foreign policy. Uh, rather than U.S.-China uh, strategic competition, uh, what the United States uh, should do is to promote dialogue and detente with China. Uh, and you know, right now, what's appalling is that these two countries have really not engaged in a serious uh, dialogue during the Biden administration uh, uh, to talk about differences, and also areas of common interest, and to deal with uh, the more challenging existential threats of climate change and other transnational uh, issues. Uh, and the United States should stop inflating the threat of China. I mean, there are many things about China uh, that I'm concerned about, uh, but uh, this notion that we are now engaged in this existential struggle uh, for what kind of world order is going to exist is just foolish. And it doesn't uh, uh, match up to uh, the reality of what is uh, going on. And so that's the first thing uh, that I would uh, recommend. Now, the second thing I would recommend is we need to be more realistic and clearer about our goals regarding 
the Taiwan question. And what we need to do is to distinguish between China's motives and China's intentions. Uh, as Professor Ju uh, eloquently stated, you know, China uh, has the motive of wanting to have Taiwan unified with China. That is so much now part of Chinese identity, so much part of the identity of the regime that even if Americans would wish that China would abandon the goal of unification, there's nothing that the United States can do to change that motive. So instead of trying to change China's motive about Taiwan unification, what the United States should focus on is trying to shape the intentions of China. And here it's whether China should continue uh, to focus on peaceful means of achieving its goal of unification or whether uh, to use force. And so our goal for uh, reshaping China's intentions is to make sure that it continues to want to pursue the peaceful path to uh, unification. Now, some argue that the way to do that is to focus on military deterrence so that that increases the risks and costs for China in using military force. You know, because uh, the United States and the allies has such a robust military capability, uh, if China tried to use military force to unify Taiwan with China, uh, it would be unable to do so. And through uh, deterrence, uh, it would shape uh, China's intentions uh, to be more uh, peaceful. But I don't believe that military deterrence on its own uh, can shape uh, or influence Chinese intentions. What is necessary is to persuade China uh, that the peaceful road to unification is still possible sometime in the future and to be patient uh, about that until the circumstances change so that uh, peaceful unification uh, can become a real reality. So it's not to push China into a corner. And what is the way to do that? Well, you know, I take my cues from uh, Thomas Schelling's classic work, A Strategy of, of Conflict, where he lays out in rigorous fashion uh, the main uh, principles of deterrence theory. And one of the things he says uh, is that uh, for deterrence to be effective, it has to be complemented by credible assurances uh, that the core interests of the target of deterrence would be respected. And there are many cases of deterrence failure uh, uh, when the deterring country does not respect uh, the core interests uh, of the country that is the target state that is trying to be deterred. So we should make much more credible by clarifying and stating uh, restating clearly uh, our one China policy uh, that we do not support the independence of Taiwan. We oppose unilateral moves by Taiwan toward uh, independence. And we welcome any arrangement about Taiwan determined by Beijing and Taipei peacefully and without coercion. In other words, basically, if China and Taiwan reunify, that's fine. We don't want to keep China and Taiwan separated for our strategic reasons or for strategic competition with uh, uh, China. Secondly, we should be much more restrained uh, about our high level official interactions with Taiwan. Uh, we should emphasize again uh, 
according to the understanding that we reach during normalization, that our interactions with China, uh, with Taiwan, will be non-official. It will be primarily in the cultural and economic uh, uh, levels. We should not do things like having the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, go to uh, Taiwan. It was highly provocative. And, and I've heard that even the Taiwan government was not so happy about that because uh, they knew uh, that this would probably lead to um, uh, threats uh, to Taiwan's uh, security. Uh, and so uh, members of Congress might think by, by going to Taiwan to, sh to kind of express its security commitment of the United States to Taiwan is doing Taiwan a big favor, but in fact, it's counterproductive. What it does is it provokes China and makes Taiwan's security uh, uh, more tenuous. And then um, I would uh, recommend uh, that the United States be much more cautious about mobilizing allies for the defense of Taiwan, especially uh, mobilizing Japan. I've been arguing that it is in Japan's interest to maintain a policy of strategic ambiguity uh, and that Japan should caution the United States to not do the sorts of things that provoke China. Because if there is a war over the Taiwan Strait, Next to Taiwan, the country that will suffer huge consequences is Japan. And so Japan has a stake. And, and so uh, you know, I've been telling my friends and colleagues in Japan that they should be asking the Japanese government uh, not to kind of sign on uh, to the American position uh, regarding Taiwan. Uh, next, I would say that the United States, should, uh, you know, in the context of, of an improvement in U.S.-China relations, should encourage Beijing to come up with a more attractive formula or vision for Taiwan unification than the one country, two systems for, formula. I mean, it's clear that the current one country, two systems formula has no attractiveness and credibility in Taiwan, especially after the events in Hong Kong. So I think Beijing can do better, should do better, to come up with a vision for, and a process for Taiwan unification uh, that would be more attractive to Taiwan. And then finally, I would say that the United States, when it does interact, with Taiwan representatives, should, they should encourage Taiwan to be more restrained about its rhetoric and its position regarding Taiwan's independence. And for example, it would be great if the Democratic Progressive Party uh, would eliminate one part of its ch charter, which basically talks about the independence of Taiwan. And Americans should also advise the people in Taiwan that the best way to preserve and expand this international space is by improving relations with the mainland. Thank you. Wonderful. Much it was very helpful, Mike. And uh, Xu Quan, we're looking equally forward for your thoughts on what would be uh, the best alternative policy. Please go ahead. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I totally agree with Professor Mojizuki's uh, comments and uh, options, you know, what uh, the United States can do, um, especially, you know, when you say that the, uh, you know, Japan can play a more active role more positive role, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, this not only applies to Japan, it applies to all US allies. I think, you know, I recently came back from Australia, you know, there's such a debate in Australia as well, you know, what should Australia do 
should Australia just side with the United States in its global uh, competition with China? Or can Australia, uh, you know, be a kind of a mediator, you know, try to help to lower tensions between the two great powers? So I absolutely agree with you, Mike, you know, about uh, Japan's uh, potential uh, more positive role in lower intentions between not just between the United States and China, but also between Taiwan and and people people's Republic of China. You know, uh, another comment you mentioned you know, about this, you know, leaving this door open, leaving this peaceful unification door open. I think that's absolutely vital. You know, because what we see now here is that the United States uh, basically is resorting to military deterrence. Uh, we're not doing anything to promote peaceful dialogue, as I mentioned earlier. You know. That has been the U.S. practice, actually, to promote peaceful dialogue between the two sides. But we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we solely rely on military deterrence, as if the PRC can be deterred. <laughs> but as uh, what you, Zuki also mentioned, I don't think you know the PRC can be deterred on the Taiwan issue. You know, uh, I think the PRC. You know, I hate to say, you know, the PRC will go ahead no matter how you try to deter it. I mean, I think for the PRC, even even. Uh, on the Taiwan issue, even a Pyrrhic victory is a victory, you know, unfortunately. You know. So, uh, I, well, I, I just want to add a few, uh, maybe uh, just a little uh, more comments of my own, and uh, um, I don't want to take too much time. I know we have a lot of questions. So I think, you know, uh, going forward, you know, what can the United States and can China do, you know, uh, for the same, uh, for the same, uh, uh, by the same token here, right? I think, you know, both the United States and China uh, need to adapt to the changing power structure in the world today. What I see here is the, is the, uh, is the changing uh, power structure in the international system. The United States has to realize that the Western dominance of global affairs has come to an end and we are entering a multipolar world. Um, China, on the other hand, I think needs to be more sensitive to other countries' concerns and anxieties associated with China's growing power. Uh, oftentimes, we, we we talk about you know China's uh, uh, you know, the, this uh, war of war diplomacy. Um, I I think you know it it hurts China's image. You know, uh, China definitely needs to be more sensitive, especially to uh, its Asian neighbors, these smaller neighbors. I think they're 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 scared. You know, to some extent, about China's uh, rise. Uh, in 1978, China's GDP was only about 4% of the US GDP. 2021, it was about 77% of the US GDP. So obviously, uh, in the 1970s, China did not pose any threat to the United States. So Washington actually accepted all the demands from Beijing. Uh, including cutting relations with Chiang Kai-shek's ROC government, terminating U.S.-Taiwan uh, military alliance, and withdrawing all U.S. troops from Taiwan. Today, we all know China is perceived as a pacing threat to the U.S. US security by the U.S. government. And of course, uh, Sinophobia uh, is, is uh, prevailing you know, in U.S. Uh, domestic politics. However, I wonder, this Sinophobia, to what extent it's based on uh, the fear of China's real threat to national security, or is it driven by the scale of competition and a multipolar world? Because the United States is not used to this changing power structure, not used to, to being not, not being number one again in many aspects. So when you, when you realize that our political leaders and military generals are busy predicting when the US-China war over Taiwan will break out. According to one general, as soon as 2027, right? Um, but nobody's talking about how to avoid war and promote peace. You know something's wrong here, definitely wrong. Um, you look at major official documents such as the US National Security Strategy document, some keywords like competition, rivalry, confrontation, and conflict permeate those documents, while other keywords like peace and cooperation are completely missing. The history of US-China relationship shows that the two countries were able to live together and cooperate 
not because they had shared values, but because of common interests. As Mike also mentioned, you know, today I think their common interests still outweigh their differences. Climate change, dwarfs, really, dwarfs, or in all, the, all those other challenges globally. For both the United States and China, the biggest threat to their economic and the political security comes from within, not from each other. American politics is now bewitched by Sinophobia. Many members of Congress are anti-China for the sake of being anti-China. The political atmosphere in Washington is so toxic that these politicians are competing over who is more hawkish on China. They do not think and they refuse to listen to different views as reflected in the recent TikTok hearing the other day. So the fundamental question is how to deal with China's rise and its challenge to US supremacy. Xu Kuan, you should, you should uh, wrap, wrap up so we could have questions. Yeah, sure, okay. So I, I remember uh, the Democratic uh, representative, uh, Rick Lawson uh, from uh, Washington, put it very nicely. He said, in a race, if a rival is gaining upon you, you run faster, not try to trick them. So in Beijing's view, of course, many of US policies today are designed to block China's rise, which leads to a lose-lose outcome for both countries. Now, finally, coming back to the Taiwan issue, I think it takes all three sides to backtrack a little, to reset the status quo in the Taiwan Strait in order to avoid a military conflict. Uh, because in the, in the Washington-Beijing-Taipei relationship, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's entering a vicious cycle with lots of finger pointing. Nobody's doing any self-reflection. Going forward, I think China must be more patient and perhaps need to, need, needs to work harder to win the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese people. Should scale down military and diplomatic pressures on Taiwan. Now these measures were designed, were, me were meant to punish the D DPP government, but they have alienated the Taiwanese public. After what happened in Hong Kong in recent years, I think the one country and two systems model has become even less popular in Hong Kong, uh, in Taiwan. So the PRC government may wish to rethink this model and perhaps come up with a, a revised or a different model to win support in Taiwan. Now, how about the United States? I think the United States, including Congress, must be more prudent. Some serious questions must be answered with participation of the American public, such as uh, through this uh, webinar today. Uh, final two questions uh, for everybody to think, you know. Number one, while deterrence has become Washington's dominant strategy in the Taiwan Strait vis-a-vis -vis China, what can the United States do to promote durable peace in the Taiwan Strait? I think uh, Mike also mentioned this. You know. So how, do, how to deter Beijing from taking military actions without promoting it to use force? But what, what we're seeing now is like the United States is either intentionally or uninten unintentionally provoking China to use force to turn Taiwan into a second uh, Ukraine, perhaps. Now, final question, you know, what exactly is America's end goal in Taiwan. Is the United States pursuing a policy of keeping Taiwan permanently separate from China? And if that's the goal, are Americans willing to fight with the Chinese to achieve it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Xu Kun. And uh, what I'm gonna do now is ask questions. Uh, uh, some of them have come from uh, my own response to what you've been saying. And some of them are distillations in, from what I'm seeing in the Q&A column. But several people asked about the uh, one country, two systems policy. And uh, Xiquin, you just finished with that. And I wonder if you could, I'm gonna ask you first, uh, and then Mike to also comment, if you could tell us briefly what what China means when it uses that term and how the events in Hong Kong have possibly soured, uh, uh, Mike re alluded to this as well, how the events in Hong Kong may have soured the views of the 
of the Taiwanese people about this notion. And you said that China has to think of, of an alternative to that. So could you just tell us what uh, one country, two systems means and how it's run into trouble? Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, one country, two systems uh, is now being practiced in Hong Kong and Macau, but it was first developed, actually initially developed for for Hong Kong, for, for Taiwan as as a future model of unification. You know, or um, well, according to the PRC, uh, uh, the uh, uh, this model means that you know there will be only one uh, central government uh, that is in Beijing, right? And uh, after unification, uh, Taiwan can keep uh, its own government, its own uh, uh, you know currency, its own political economic system. Uh, Taiwan will uh, will uh, uh, be able to basically enjoy uh, the current status, whatever uh, they have right now. They are not going to lose anything. Uh, so that's Beijing's version. You know, basically, uh, th there can be only one central government. Uh, the, the Republic of China is not recognized, of course, by the PRC, right? And of course, I think the application of one country and two systems in Hong Kong is a little bit different uh, here because. Uh, when the when the when the British government and Chinese government negotiated uh, over the future of Hong Kong in the 1980s, Hong Kong had no choice. You know, basically it's between the, the British and the, the Chinese governments. And uh, Deng Xiaoping actually told Mrs. Thatcher, you know, look, you know, uh, there's no discussion about Hong Kong's return to China. <laughs> so Hong Kong has to be returned to China. Uh, so other than that, you know, we can talk about how to help Hong Kong maintain its autonomy uh, for the future. Uh, that that's that's how you know uh, uh, you know the one country two system model was applied to to Hong Kong. So after 1997, Hong Kong was able to maintain its uh, economic system. It has its own passport, its own currency. Uh, but uh, politically, of course, of course, Hong Kong is just a, a special administrative region of China, and uh, China is taking care of its its uh, military, uh, of course, also uh, and its foreign affairs. Now I think. Uh, after 1997, Beijing has tried to loosen this uh, framework for Taiwan a little bit. Uh, for example, uh, Beijing has said many times that under one China, anything can be discussed. Uh, th that's a pretty, <laughs> uh, you know, you know a loose framework for Taiwan, right? I think you know sometimes they also said that Taiwan can even maintain its troops. Uh, th this is not applied to Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong cannot doesn't have its own troops. So from Beijing's perspective, you know, this is already very generous, right? But of course, the problem here is that the Taiwanese people feel that they have a choice, unlike the people in Hong Kong, they have no choice. The people in, in Taiwan feel that they, they are independent, right? Republic of China has been independent since 1911. Uh, so they don't think that the, the, you know, uh, the PRC can tell them what to do. Uh, so that's the exact problem. That's why you know, from the very beginning, one country and two system model has not been popular in Taiwan. And especially after recent years, what happened in, in Hong Kong? I mean, China obviously has tried to uh, tighten control over there a little bit, and in, in the view of Taiwanese, you know, the, you know that makes this model even less popular. So that's why I have argued many times that you know, uh, if you keep talking about you know one country two system, it's not going to sell in Taiwan. I think the PRC uh, needs to be a little bit more uh, realistic, uh, more pragmatic, and. Uh, I don't know, maybe one country, uh, three systems, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, a modified a model. Thank you. Based on, yeah, based on this uh, original one country, two systems, probably is going to be a little bit more attractive. Otherwise, I, I, I think we're, 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 we're hitting a, a, a dead, dead end here. That, that was very helpful, Shukran. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, can I ask you if if you have anything to add to this? You spoke about uh, how Taiwanese people were, as a result of the the crackdown in Hong Kong, had soured on this, and young people were turning in another direction. What do you think China, mainland China, has to do to win uh, support from the Taiwanese uh, for peaceful reunification? Uh, yes. So I, I think the key issue is the substance of what's meant by two systems. Uh, and, and certainly, I think China credibly uh, would respect uh, Taiwan's uh, economic system. 
But I think the fundamental issue is to what extent China is willing uh, to guarantee the existence of Taiwan's current democratic political system. And so that means uh, the free and open uh, elections. Uh, that means uh, guarantee of basic uh, civil liberties and political rights, including the freedom of, of speech and the freedom of, of the press. And now I think that that is fundamentally important. Now the difficulty is, is that uh, as long when you have the freedom of the press and the freedom of speech, there are going to be uh, political forces and citizens, residents of Taiwan who will be critical of the regime uh, in Beijing. Uh, but China has to tolerate that uh, if it wants uh, Taiwan uh, to uh, actually embrace the uh, Chinese kind of vision to have serious talks about unification. Uh, but uh, I think it would be in the interest of China also uh, to move towards greater openness. I mean, right now, uh, Xi Jinping has uh, engaged in one crackdown after another. Uh, but I think, um, you know, as Professor Zhu uh, indicated, uh, China must be much more sensitive about uh, its power and the kind of fears that China's rise is invoking, uh, provoking uh, on the part of neighboring uh, countries. And one way to alleviate those fears is for China to, it doesn't have to become a full blown democracy, uh, but to move uh, gradually away from the current crackdown uh, to uh, a little bit more uh, openness as there was in the past. And that would make uh, this notion of uh, kind of a renewed one country, two systems formula uh, more credible. But I think the, the bottom line is that there has to be credible guarantees uh, of the, the survival of Taiwan's uh, democracy. Thank you. So I, I've been sorting through the questions that uh, our audience members have asked, and I'm going to uh, tried my best to to reflect them in, in questions to to our panelists, and uh, either of you could respond to this. And, and that's about a question about the Xi Jinping factor in all of this. Uh, to to what degree uh, do, do you think that um, that that Xi's uh, hardening of his position? Over the past few years, on Taiwan, uh, is capable of, of of change, or or is I don't know how, quite how to put it. Is is all you both have made very useful suggestions about what China has to do to avoid uh, confrontation over Taiwan? Is Xi Jinping capable of that kind of flexibility, or does this have to await a future leader of China? Uh, so, so that's the essence of the question. To what degree is Xi Jinping's own um, power, pursuit of power, a factor in all of this? So maybe, is you, Quinn, if you wouldn't mind, if you have something to say about it, I'll ask either of you or both, but you could each address that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think, you know, uh, you look at the uh, record, you know, so what happened in 2015? Xi Jinping and Ma Yingzhou met in Singapore. So is Xi Jinping flexible? Yes, he's very flexible, right? And uh, I, I think, you know, it's uh, when you say Xi Jinping has hardened his position towards Taiwan, I'm not so sure, you know, to what extent is his uh, adjustment of policy and reaction to what has happened in Taiwan and what has happened you know, in Taiwan-US relations? I think that's questionable. Uh, I don't think you know, it, it, it's, it's fair to say that he, or Xi Jinping has just hardened his position on Taiwan. I think to a large extent, it's a reaction to uh, what the United States and what Taiwan have been doing in the past mm. few years. So mm. I, I definitely think that uh, there's a, a possibility that uh, uh, Xi Jinping will 
change his approach again to be nicer, if you like, you know, to be softer, you know. Obviously, uh, if uh, the ruling party in Taiwan change its attitude, you know, then the cooperation, peace across the Taiwan Street is highly likely. Why not? Because it happened, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, between 2008 and 2016, when Ma Ying-jeou was in power, Taiwan was not a major issue at all, not a major issue in U.S.-China relations either, you know. Uh, well, so, so I think, you know, we, we need to think, you know, why, why there was a period of peace and, and, and prosperity and, and friendship, a lot of travels across the two sides. Why we had that ex experience during that period? Why we don't have it now? I don't think it's just the Xi Jinping, obviously, right? Thank you. And Mike, do you have anything uh, uh, you uh, add? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I am not a specialist of Chinese politics uh, uh, like Professor uh, Zhu, uh, but uh, I, I've been uh, analyzing uh, Sino Japanese relations and very much uh, the, and the policies that, that took place during uh, the leadership of Hu Jintao. Uh, and one of the problems of the Hu Jintao period, and Hu Jintao uh, basically uh, wanted to improve relations with Japan. And after uh, the Japanese prime minister stopped going to the Yasukuni shrine, uh, when you know, Abe first became prime minister, he moved very quickly to improve relations uh, with uh, Japan, uh, uh, so much so that uh, uh, China made quite a few compromises with Japan on, on an agreement uh, to turn the East China Sea into a sea of peace, prosperity uh, through joint uh, development. Uh, but then uh, that policy was attacked uh, by nationalists uh, and maybe from uh, 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 some quarters that uh, wanted to keep uh, Hu Jintao in check. The silver lining about uh, the concentration of power around Xi Jinping and the fact that he is stridently a nationalist is that he covers the nationalist flank. I mean, he controls that. And so he is someone, I think, that has the opportunity when the time becomes ripe to actually be much more dovish and accommodating towards Taiwan without fearing of a nationalist backlash. So um, I, I know that there's a lot of criticism and alarm about uh, the power of Xi Jinping, uh, but uh, there might be a silver uh, lining uh, to mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Uh, so uh, another question, uh, is about the significance of the visit to the mainland by former Taiwanese President Ma Ying-jeou, if I pronounce that correctly. And uh, is, is it possible that uh, there's a shift taking place in Taiwan itself away from the, uh, from the uh, Democratic Progressive Party stance towards, you know, towards a, towards a, Away, away from a from an independence move towards more. Is there any shifts taking place in Taiwan? Let me put it that way. Either if you could answer, if if you have some thoughts on that. Okay, I go first to Mike. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a, a shift here. You know, it's very interesting because you know you're right. You know, Ma ying is visiting the mainland right now. At the same time, the current president. Tsai Ing-wen is visiting the United States. Well, she's, I think she's just arrived in New York City uh, on her way to Central America, you know. So these two visits, for me, almost represent two different visions for Taiwan, two different approaches to Taiwan's future relationship with China, right? So my angel comes from uh, KMT. The KMT policy, well, KMT still follows the ROC constitution, believing in one China, first of all, right? Uh, so I think that my angel's visit to the mainland is very significant. However, we have to remember, you know, KMT or my angel, they are not in power now. They are in opposition. Uh, my angel is just an, an ordinary citizen now, right? He, he's, he's not a leader of Taiwan now. So 
So I don't think there was any uh, major shift of policy here. As, as a matter of fact, the two, the two visits, you know, my angel going to Chinese mainland, Tsai Ing-wen come to the United States, actually represent the two distinct approaches of the two parties. For the, for the KMT, they still place, uh, in, in, in history actually, they place the cross-strait relations above foreign relations. But now increasingly, they believe that cross-strait relations is equally important as Taiwan's foreign relations. That's the KMT's position, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The DPP's position has always been foreign relations, US policy. That's all. They don't care about mm -hmm. it. Uh, they, 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 are, they either do not care or incapable of improving relations with the mainland. So the, these are distinct approaches. And of course, the DPP is in power now. That's why you have this dilemma. You know, There's no improvement of cross taiwan Strait relations. And the DPP will only be a pro-US party. They are not. They they cannot do anything. They don't know how to improve relations uh, with 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 the mainland. I, I, Mike, I was mentioned earlier. You know, maybe they should, uh, you know, change that uh, clause in the DPP party charter, right? To you know, I I, I wow, well, yeah, good idea. But I I doubt the DPP will do it, right? Yeah, obviously. Thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, I I would agree with Professor Ju that there, uh, that. These two kind of visits, uh, Ma's visit to uh, mainland China uh, and Tsai Ing-wen's uh, visit uh, uh, or transit through the United States just uh, kind of reflects the deep division uh, within the Taiwan polity. You know, what, what people call the Pan Blue versus the, the Pan Green coalition. Uh, but what's really important is the next presidential election. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, th there are people, many people in Taiwan who, you know, would prefer Taiwan to be independent if it could be done peacefully, but they are alarmed by the prospect of war. Uh, and so uh, my angel's visit to China could actually kind of lead some to, to think that, well, maybe under the DPP, Although you know, I support a lot of things about the DPP, maybe under the DPP, uh, the risk of war has increased. Uh, and that might affect uh, the discourse in the next election. Even uh, if the DPP wins in the next election, uh, that might provide some constraints uh, uh, on uh, the DPP, whoever the candidate uh, is. So in that sense, it, it could have some uh, effect. Thank you. And I have a question really for you, Mike, uh, that came up, which is, and this uh, is about, Taiwan is not the only dispute in this part of the world. As you know, and Chu Quen knows, there are other territorial disputes in which China is involved. In the East China Sea over the Senkaku or Daiyu Islands in the South China Sea, about the Spratly Islands uh, and the Paracel Islands. There have been some recent activity in, in around both of these. Japan is involved with the Senkaku Islands. And a question came up, how, how do we persuade China to, um, to, to, to eschew the use of force in resolving these disputes in the Asia Pacific region, Taiwan, but, but the others as well, and to uh, to, to solve, to, to agree to resolve these disputes through diplomacy and, and uh, uh, by cooperative agreement. Okay, well, so first of all, uh, uh, protection of sovereignty uh, is a core interest of, of China. Uh, but uh, regarding these territorial disputes in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, China has not used military force. Uh, it has uh, used Coast Guard vessels. It has used uh, fishing boats uh, uh, in kind of a gray zone tactic way uh, to basically, from the Chinese point of view, to prevent a further weakening of their claim to those disputed uh, islets, uh, whether it's in the East China Sea or the South 
uh, uh, China state, but it has not used uh, force. The important thing about the dispute between Japan and China uh, on the Senkaku or Daoyu Islands is, first of all, it was the Republic of China on Taiwan that made that claim against uh, Japan. And then that kind of compelled the People's Republic of China uh, to also push for that claim because they didn't want to be less nationalistic than the ROC. So that's kind of the origin of it. And what kept the peace was a implicit understanding that there was an issue Call it what you will, a uh, territorial dispute. But there was an issue regarding the Senkaku Daoyu Islands. Uh, Prime Minister Tanaka raised that in the normalization talks in September 1972. Uh, uh, but the understanding was they would put it to the side for the sake of good Japan China uh, relations. But what has happened over time is that the Japanese have moved away from this kind of implicit understanding to basically denying that there was any kind of implicit understanding and what you know some former diplomats of Japan called a gentleman's agreement uh, and says there is no territorial dispute. And then on top of that, Japanese nationalists have kind of provoked uh, the reemergence of this issue. And so what you're seeing today uh, is kind of the after effect of the crisis in tw uh, 2012 after the Japanese government purchased three of the uh, islands of the Senkaku, Senkakus, and the Chinese started to um, uh, deploy uh, Coast Guard vessels and go into the territorial waters. But after a while, the situation became pretty stable. And the number of intrusions stabilized to maybe about twice a month. But recently they picked up. Why? Because Japanese fishing boats, some of them are sponsored by nationalist groups, have basically gone into the territory waters of the Senkaku Islands before it was kind of seen tacitly as a place you would avoid. And they would go there right under the noses of the Chinese Coast Guard. And if you are a captain of the Chinese Coast Guard vessel, if you did not track that Japanese fishing boat, I mean, you would probably uh, lose your job because there's a possibility that that nationalist fishing boat might actually land on the Senkaku Islands. Uh, and so, Right now, uh, the dominant discourse, both in the United States and, and Japan, is that what China is doing is, is completely unprovoked. Uh, but it's not. And so I think the, the best way to handle this is to kind of recognize that there is an issue between China and Japan. And, and they came very close in 2014, in November 2014 with an understanding about that and build on that and basically try to work out a deal so that those islets become kind of a no-go zone, uh, kind of a nature preserve. And the Japanese won't go, but in turn, uh, the Chinese would not uh, send Coast Guard vessels to the area. And that would defuse the situation. Uh, but unfortunately, we're right at the brink of a militarization of this uh, dispute. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I, th I think it would be good if uh, Xi Jinping and, and the top leadership of Japan could uh, meet and begin to talk about ways to defuse the situation and bring to life the uh, June 2008 uh, agreement of principles. Uh, for joint development of the East China Sea. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think I'll go on to other questions because we're running out of time. And I, 
like to have as many as I possibly can. Now, one, one question is, is partly a compliment to the two of you, uh, which I will share that uh, you're conducting such an informative and intelligent policy discussion. Uh, how can this be duplicated? Is, first of all, is this kind of conversation occurring at the high policy levels in Washington? And if not, how do we persuade policymakers to think as rationally um, and thoughtfully as you are? Do you have any thoughts on that? Maybe she couldn't, you could start. <laughs> well, um, I think we are only doing these kind of things in our limited power, you know, to, to voice our concerns about uh, US foreign policy towards China right now. Uh, I think uh, obviously our voice needs to get louder, you know, uh, so that uh, uh, common sense uh, will prevail, you know, in Washington. Because right now, as I said, you know, Congress especially uh, is is bewitched by xenophobia. You know, uh, they, they they are they are senseless now. You know, so uh, it's it's hard. Uh, but I think you know, little by little, you know, through these kind of webinars, uh, through other outreach activities. I mean, I personally keep writing, you know, opinion pieces. Uh, if there are journalists in the audience, feel free to come talk to me. You know. I'd be happy to share my views, uh, you know, to a wider audience, so that people will be. I'm not saying that my view is always correct. Right? I, I want to, people to know that you know there are different perspectives, so people, the general public, American public, will be better informed, to to be more engaged in our policy discussion. Not to you know because our policy, I think, is hijacked, is kidnapped, by warmongers and 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 and, uh, and these extreme nationalists, you know. And they are senseless. You know, they are not listening to uh, different views. And I think you know, somehow, someday, hopefully, you know, they will come to their senses. Thank you, Mike. Mike, do you have anything to uh, contribute? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe maybe I can give my perspective because uh, I, I work in Washington D.C. At, at George Washington University, uh, and um, I, I think the the, the principle officials uh, of the Biden administration, uh, even though privately they may have some concerns about the current trajectory of U.S.-China relations, uh, they are unwilling to counter this trajectory uh, because they're worried about domestic politics, that any misstep uh, by Joe Biden to look soft towards China uh, would lead to intense criticism uh, from the hawks in Congress and would damage uh, the Biden presidency. So they're very, very cautious about this. But I've talked to uh, officials at the lower levels, uh, intelligence analysts who have a much more moderate and pragmatic and realistic attitude uh, towards China. Uh, that doesn't mean that they agree with everything that I said today, uh, but they, they are not uh, the warmongers. Uh, uh, but their voice is not uh, heard. I mean, you know, they have to keep their jobs. They got to follow uh, what the top leadership uh, uh, is proposing. Also, there are a number of former officials, former ambassadors to, to China, top China uh, hands who are concerned about the direction of the Biden administration. And they're beginning to voice uh, some of their concerns at various conferences. But I think on the whole, Washington suffers from what Fareed Zakaria recently stated uh, in a terrific piece in the Washington Post that uh, the United States or Washington DC suffers from groupthink. And, and one reason for that is that uh, there is kind of a tyranny of consensus among the so-called think tanks in Washington DC who all want to seem tougher on China than the other think tank. And there are very few research institutions uh, that challenge that view. I'm affiliated with one of those. Uh, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And I'm a non-resident fellow there. And I work with my good friend, Michael Swain and other colleagues 
uh, to trying to fashion a policy of restraint uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, region. But unfortunately, the other think tanks uh, all kind of reinforce this hawkish anti-China uh, rhetoric uh, that is part of uh, the kind of the atmosphere and group thing of Washington, DC. Thank you. So uh, we're nearing the end. There are other questions. Some of them are asking specifically for information for you to elaborate on some of your points. Uh, there's questions uh, to provide more information on the uh, what I think Xuquan began with of, of a buildup of U.S. forces on Taiwan, U.S. the training that's underway. And rather than have us do uh, go through that now, let's take the last minute or two. If each of you could say where uh, your where your publications can be found and any particular sources you could recommend for for more information on this topic. So I'll start with you, Mike. You mentioned the Quincy Institute. That's so tell us uh, how people could get information from oh, there. Okay, so, so, right, so you can just Google uh, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And then once you get uh, land on uh, the homepage of uh, responsible, uh, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, you'll just search uh, China, Taiwan, and, and you'll see uh, lots of commentary reports uh, and webinars uh, about uh, this issue. Uh, also, I recently uh, wrote an article for the journal, The Washington Quarterly, which is published uh, from the Alias School of uh, George Washington University, entitled Tokyo's Taiwan Conundrum, What Can Japan Do to Prevent War? Uh, and I'm sorry to say that this is about the only article that I've read about how Japan can actually prevent war rather than how Japan can actually uh, prepare for war. Uh, and so uh, you could just Google that, Mochizuki, Tokyo's Taiwan conundrum, and uh, uh, you can access that article. Terrific, terrific. And Shukun. Well, uh, uh, I think, you know, yes, uh, Mike mentioned the Quincy Institute, and I often also uh, get online and learn something from there. But also I want to mention our own, uh, you know, the, the committee for saying U.S.-China policy, you know, maintained by uh, Michael, Professor Michael Clare and uh, uh, Joseph, you know. I think uh, our website also contains lots of uh, uh, published articles, you know, other resources about uh, a more balanced approach to China, a more peaceful approach towards China. So you can find the information over there. Uh, uh, you know, for my own uh, publication, I mean, you, yeah, again, you can just Google and type my name. And and I want to highlight perhaps, you know, <laughs> uh, my two recent publications with the, the Hill, I think Michael mentioned earlier, you know, I wrote two uh, uh, op-eds, op you know, for the Hill, directly related to our topic uh, for today, you know. First one was actually was published uh, last year, you know, titled, uh, bucking the anti-China trend, and the the other one just published uh, probably last week. You know, questioning the hawk, U.S. hawkish policy towards China. Uh, so you can easily find them online. And my other publica publication probably you know you're not interested in it. <laughs> but I also want to mention actually uh, uh, because we'll talk about the, how to challenge this uh, uh, Washington consensus. You know, uh, I also read these. Uh, Articles uh, uh, and uh, commentaries written by uh, mostly Australian retired uh, diplomats, but also uh, people from around the world, including from the United States, have also contributed to uh, uh, to their discussions. There's a, a website in Australia called Hers and Ir Irritations. Hers and Irritations. You know, you can again you can Google and find them. Uh, th this is a website maintained by former Australian diplomats and officials. They are challenging. Uh, U.S. policy, challenge Australia policy. Uh, I think that's also a good source if you want to learn some alternative uh, perspectives. Thank you both. Uh, so uh, before I wind up, uh, let, let me both start by by thanking both of you for excellent 
presentations and giving us a lot of food for thought about how to proceed in the same way in a non-military way forward on this most delicate of issues, uh, most sensitive of issues. Like I said, the economists calling Taiwan the most dangerous place on earth. And so your wisdom is greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mike Mokazuki and Jiquan Zhu. And uh, let me uh, say also for more information, please go to our website. It's sameuschinapolicy.org, where you'll find answers to some of your questions. There's certainly a lot of documentation and data there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you for joining us tonight, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.